I'm Brendan Nigama. I'm a cinematographer. This is Matt Donnelly, senior film writer from Variety, and you're you listening listen to, to the Go, Go Creative, Creative Show. Hey, everyone. My name is Ben Consoli. I am a director and owner of BC Media Productions. This is the Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers. Well, I hope you guys are staying healthy and staying productive. Um, you know, as I'm sure you know, as I'm sure you probably feel, uh, the production industry has been hit hard by COVID-19. You know, we're seeing it everywhere, from Hollywood all the way down. Now, we had an episode planned for today. It was going to be um, with Paul Cameron, the director of photography for Westworld season three. And we are absolutely going to be putting that episode out, so don't worry. But um, it, it was more important that we talk about COVID-19 and its impact on production. So what we're doing here at Go Creative Show is we are going to be putting out two episodes on this. This first one, what you're hearing now, is at the higher level, you know, higher level production, Hollywood level production. And we've got two great guests talking about two different angles from it. Um, we've got Brendan Ugama, who is a cinematographer. Uh, he was on this summer for Child's Play. He's also done Riverdale, Sabrina on Netflix and more. And he's going to talk to us about his experience. His show got shut down five days in. So we're going to talk to him about the experience of hearing that news, where it comes from, what do you do afterwards? And then we also have a pretty good discussion on what we can do now as filmmakers to keep ourselves busy, take advantage of this time and um, make sure that we come out even better than we came in. So there's a lot in there. And I think you guys are going to really like that discussion. And then after that, we talked to uh, Matt Donnelly, who's a senior film writer for Variety. And Matt gives us a really interesting look at kind of the top level uh, look at COVID-19's impact on Hollywood as a whole. So we talk about what the production studios are doing, what the movie studios are doing. Um, a big discussion about do we release films that are finished on digital? Do we even completely bypass the movie theaters? And if we do, is that going to only further inflame the conflict that streaming services and movie theaters have already? Um, we also get into a big discussion about uh, the process that a film goes through when it's campaigning for award season. So it's not all doom and gloom COVID-19 stuff. There's a lot of really fun kind of interesting um, information in there too. So yes, we are going to talk about COVID-19, but we are also going to be offering you some tips, advice, some hope, and certainly entertainment to get you through this time. And then the next episode is going to be all about kind of the local level of production, um, which I think the vast majority of our audience really is going to feel the impact of. Freelancers, um, you know, writers, artists, cinematographers, what, what are we doing at the local level um, to you know, keep ourselves occupied and busy? And how does this impact us? And that's going to be our next episode. So don't worry for those Westworld fans. I promise you that episode is coming out uh, and so much more. And I can't thank you enough for your support throughout this time. And if you have any questions, for us. If, you, if there's any topics you want us to discuss, if you're nervous about anything and want us to tackle an issue, please send it to us on our social media. Uh, you can find us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Um, we also give you an opportunity to ask our guests questions, and we do a lot of that today. Uh, get a lot of questions for Brandon um, and, uh, and so much more. So definitely do that. And also follow us uh, or, or subscribe to us rather on your favorite podcast app. Search for Go Creative Show. Click subscribe. That way you never miss an episode. And I want to mention that this episode is sponsored by Post Lab, stress-free collaboration for Final Cut Pro 10, and MZ, education for creatives. So let's dive right in because there's so much to talk about. I'm going to kick it off with cinematographer Brendan Ugama. So I'm here with Brendan Ugama, cinematographer and former guest of Go Creative Show. Welcome back. Um, I wish the circumstances were better, but welcome back nonetheless. Yes, thank you for having me. So we had you on for Child's Play this summer. And wow, has the world changed sure <laughs> since has. this yeah. summer. It's crazy. So right now... Since a couple of weeks ago or a few it, weeks ago. <laughs> it's it's crazy. Um, yes. right, it's, it's March 21st today, and I've been reminding people the date during this episode because... Things change constantly, and we're a weekly show, yeah. you know? So you guys got to keep this in mind. Stuff that we're talking about now could be completely different by the time you're listening to it. So just for context, 
It is March 21st, and we're we're talking about our experiences up until today. So, um, and it's an ever changing yeah. thing. So, I wanted you on the show today, um, Brendan, because this episode is kind of all about um, COVID 19s impact on production, but at at the higher level, the stuff you're working in, Hollywood and um, big t- big TV shows and all that. Next episode, for those of you guys um, that are listening now, w- is going to be more at the local level. So we're going to be talking to people that are sort of in, you know, my boat, I'm sure some of your boats too, like working at the local level, smaller commercials, corporate video, live events, things that, you know, we're doing at the smaller local level and um, how this virus has impacted that. Um and we also kind of want to talk about some advice and tips to keep our sanity throughout this time. Um, but I want to start, Brandon, with just kind of what were you working on before this hit? And did did your project shut down? I, yeah, uh, I was working on a show called The Brides. It's a pilot. Uh, it was a new pilot that we were we were five days into production when it shut down. Um, out of how many? Out of 14. Mm. Um I've been doing a month of prep, or I had already done a month of prep. We were shooting in New York. Um, and uh, yeah, we were you know busy into it when we started hearing hearing all the news of production different productions shutting down and if it was gonna happen or not. And um, we heard a lot of mixed things before it actually officially happened for us, but we were uh, on our fifth day. What were you hearing? Because I mean, there were rumblings of this. I remember going to Chicago in January and hearing about, this coronavirus, which I don't even think at the time it had been given the name COVID-19. Um, at least I didn't know of it. And people were concerned, but it still felt far enough away that no one foresaw what, what ended up happening. But like, what were you hearing in the industry kind of leading up to the shutdown? Well, I think, you know, early in January and, and uh, early in February, it was as you're saying, it was so distant. It was, you know, it was overseas where it was happening the most and it was not impacting our, like the industry here as much and and the average lives of, of, um, Americans. But it was, it was only, you know, a few days before we really shut down that it really was taking, you know, the leading conversation, uh, around set and industry and the industry. And what I had noticed was mostly like in New York, at least it was mostly just different conversations of, of, you know, crews that were talking back and forth saying, oh, you know, our show is shutting down for the day because someone might might have been affected or that kind of a thing. And it was really... For the day. Like, so people were just doing day, daily shutdowns. Okay. Well, at the time, that's what kind of for moments, you know, for like maybe a few hours throughout the day, that's, this was the conversation. Things would evolve quickly. Like it was unbelievable at that time, especially and, or and still now, but yeah. how quick the information was evolving and changing. But we would have crews, you know, we had people that would go home for the day and they're supposed to come back the next day. And I think some of them did. And we heard of like, you know, shows loading out kind of thing. And then they would load back in and they were still like, no one really knew what was happening. And people were just kind of trying to roll with it. Mm. And our show, The Brides was, you know, we were five days in and and no one really knew. And, you know, the studio didn't really know what to do. No one really knew what to do yet. But um I think uh, the word came in for our fifth day that we were, we were it will be the last day. I guess were you shut down while on set? Like, did they say it's done? Pack up, go home. We f- we were on set, but we finished the day. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We we did finish the day. And then what's um, we, what's well? Go ahead. No, go. No, I, I was just gonna say. I mean, that that was uh, we were shooting like at the on that day we were shooting up in Yonkers, which was you know outside of Manhattan and. We were kind of everyone was was feeling okay, so I've, everyone was okay with finishing the day and going home. Sure, yeah, sure. Now, so what did they tell you when this happens? Uh, it was kind of, and I guess maybe I mean, we might we might want to just explain like who is the they? Like, where does I mean? Obviously, this is a union job. It's a, it's a TV show. It's a pilot. So, it's a, I'm sure there's a chain of command and how messages actually get to you. So, like. How how did you hear it and from who? Well, it was, I mean, it came down from the top, of course, but it went through a few people and it was our producers and showrunners uh, who were on set who did the announcement and they brought everyone together. The whole crew, you know, stepped into a meeting um, and the AD, you know, and we just kind of, they just 
talk for five minutes, explain what was happening, took questions that people had questions, and um, and uh, just explained it very simply and matter of fact that we were we were going to close down, and mm. um, you know it was a respectful way the way it was done, and it was uh, it was good. It was the right you know it was the right thing to do, and they all knew that. So I think everyone was like was was expecting it, you know, because of you. They we all heard the rumors of other shows doing it or getting close to doing it or not, you know, we knew that this was starting to happen. So Mm -hmm. everyone knew it was coming. What goes through your head when you hear this? Well, (laughs) I mean, there's a few things, I guess for me, it was, we were like, I I live in LA. So I was in New York. I had been there doing a show before I did the Katie Keene show and went straight into this pilot of this new show. So I had been there for, almost eight months at the time. So I was like, I have to pack everything up and get out of here as soon as I can. That was a, a big concern because there was also talks of, you know, possibly like, no one really knew what was going to happen with the airlines, if they were going to stop operating completely or if it was only international flights. And so we were, um, you know, the main concern once they made the decision was to finish the day as appropriately as we could and then pack up and get ready and get out, mm-hmm. which was uh, the next day. So, but I mean, as far as like the, the virus and, and just, you know, it was just, it was so new and everyone's just, and it's, you know, we were just trying to understand what it was and how, how um, fast it could grow. And just like, it was just a, a constant trying to understand it and read, uh, read about it and, you know, try and be as safe as we could. So now when was that? When did that show get shut? Uh, that was on remember the date it was last saturday okay we so were shooting relatively yeah. recent I mean, within yeah within a week or a so week. it was a week well, yeah. there you go one week um yeah. so immediately are you just you pack up you go home and that's it um is there any sort of like lasting like is there work that you are still doing for the remaining days that you can do remotely like how how is that happening or is everything it, just completely stopped for now, for that show, everything is, has stopped. Wow. The only thing I'm doing remotely right now is I'm doing uh, my color work, color notes. I'm resorted to colored notes only because I can't, uh, you know, no one's going into color suites or anything like that. But sure. for Katie Keene, so we're, we're, we still have like four more episodes to do. Um, but otherwise, like on The Brides, that show is completely just right now, for my side of things, at least it's completely on, on, on lockdown. I've just stopped. I know that the office is still trying to tie things up and maybe they're closed now, but, uh, since it's Saturday, but I think last week they were, they were quickly working to tie, tie up any kind of loose ends. Is there talk of shows being completely canceled? Like, are they talking about that? Because what, what worries me is that, you know, I'm sure you had something booked for the summer, you know, like you did, you were going to mm-hmm. do your 15 days and then you were going to work on something else. I'm sure. When everything yeah. comes back up to speed, there's going to be this backlog of work. And I mean, how, simply, how can it be done? Your actors, your talent are going to be on other projects. Like, are there any, is there any talk about ways to keep them engaged? Or, I mean, what do people do? I don't think there's, I don't know. I don't think anyone has enough of a understanding of how it's going to unfold. No one knows how long it's going to last. You know, yeah. I mean, are we going to be locked up for a month, two months, four months. We, we just, you know, no one really knows and it's hard to kind of make any plans, of course. And I don't think anyone's, as far as I know or anything on my understanding of things, there's no, there's no discussion of how that's going to unfold yet. I'm mm-hmm. sure people are thinking of it. I'm sure studios are thinking of it and trying to figure that out. But it's, uh, you're right. I mean, there's going, there will be like a, like once things come back, all the shows that halted, are they going to start back up or certain ones going to call it, you know, or, or what? We don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, it's such a scary thought. I feel so bad for you guys. Like, I mean, I certainly feel bad for everybody that's affected by this, but it's just like, you know, you're working at, at such a high level doing really interesting stuff and you're tied up for months and months and then a project just kind of stops and it's like, ah, you know, it's different. Like for me, if I lose a commercial, it was a three-day thing. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm, I'm not losing like a multi-day, multi-episode project. Um, I'm losing, you know, a couple of days, which stinks. But the investment, like my investment in a project, a booked investment, I guess we could say, 
is a lot lower than yours when you're working on TV shows and movies and things like that. It's just a totally different situation. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, you know, everybody, everybody's affected one way or another. And it's, it's, you know, it's difficult for everyone. And, um, there's, you know, everyone's just trying to figure out how to, how to deal with it. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure the studios are, or some of the studios are feeling it pretty hard, but you know, we'll get through it. Whatever it is, we'll get through it. We just got to figure things out. Exactly. It's still so new. It's like a week into the lockdown or not even. And, it, and it's like, you know, so everyone's just under, trying to come to some sort of understanding of what it's going to be. Um, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I want to transition a little bit to ways to stay creative, stay busy, things we can do as cinematographers um, during this time. Like what, what have you been doing with your time? You know, it's, it's been interesting because it's actually been, I haven't, I personally haven't had a, a break in a very long time and uh, like more than a weekend off kind of thing in, in almost a year. So it's been, uh, it's been, it's been nice to actually be able to relax a little bit at the house and just kind of be here, you know, and, but it, it, but there are ways, you know, we do have to stay creative and it's hard to, to, you know, shut the mind off that way. So, but I think we just have to be able to like find avenues, take photographs, you know, whatever your medium is and what, whatever you're into, if, if you can create images or just get in group discussions with people about different things and doing things like this, like your podcasts are, are great for that. I mean, for me to be able to just talk about cinematography and different things is very helpful for, for that creative bug. And you have, you know, such a great inventory of, of, uh, of podcasts with fantastic filmmakers that, you know, people should be able to just listen to that kind of thing and, and educate themselves and take this time to, to really, you know, do the things that they haven't had the chance to because of the busy, hectic lifestyles that we, we normally live. But being able to read books on, on our craft or whatever inspires us, um, listen to interviews and podcasts and, uh, you know, just educate ourselves in different ways. I think that's the only thing we can do uh, right now. That's the only thing we can do in this sense. Um, and trying to find ways to stay active so that you're, you know, you can <laughs> think clearly and, and be, be good like that. But it's, um, you know, I think, uh, I think there's ways, I think there's plenty of ways to do it. You know, we just have to try different things and see what feels right. I was texting with, um, Tim Ives, the director of photography of, um, Stranger Things this morning to just get yeah. his, his thoughts on things. And I asked him about, you know, how he's staying creative. He immediately wrote back saying that, you know, he's, it's springtime as we can hear in the background, the birds are chirping behind you. Um, <laughs> well, uh, he's like, he said, he said that he's starting to take some pictures of his backyard daily, um, yeah. kind of watching the change as springtime approaches the plants and trees around him, almost getting back to like his photography roots in a way. And, yeah. you know, kind of doing still life, going out there, totally. seeing what's around you and using this time as inspiration, using what's around you as inspiration. I, I mean, how do you feel about that? Are you finding, are you finding you're taking similar steps? Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I think, I went out taking, I took photographs around my, just my house and my neighborhood the other day because um, that's kind of the main tool. That's, I mean, that tool is what started everything for me and for many filmmakers and cinematographers is the camera, it's the original camera. And it just, you know, so taking stills is kind of, you know, a path into our medium that we've been used to. It's, it's just, uh, um, and, you know, staying, staying creative, it helps with all, with all of that. And it is like a reset to our, where we started. Yeah. Um, and not just that, I think like, and I think the interesting thing right now is kind of the, not just the global reset, but just the personal lives, the reset that we're all getting to do and we're being forced to do in different ways that we weren't expecting or, or would never expect otherwise. But being able to kind of take this time to reflect on different things and get back to the basics, you know, like uh, I never would have had this chance to, do that otherwise i mean i would obviously prefer that this wasn't happening so that we, you know but it is we have to look for the silver lining in things and i think i think that's one of them so now more than ever is the perfect time to learn a new skill 
And I am so glad that we've got MZ now as a Go Creative Show sponsor. I have been a fan of MZ for years. Now, MZ is education for filmmakers and education for creatives. Simple, simple, simple. We actually had Philip Bloom on not too long ago talking about his course called Filmmaking for Photographers. Now, here's the thing. Now, MZ is a collection of hundreds of hours of high-quality video-based filmmaking education that covers directing, cinematography, post-production, visual storytelling, and more. And it's by the best educators in the business. Listen to this. Vincent LaFerre has courses. Shane Hurlbert has courses. Philip Bloom, we mentioned before, has courses there. And the ARI Academy is there. And that's just a few. So you go to mz.com, you find the course you love, you can buy it as an individual course, but what I recommend is to become an MZ Pro member because it's a subscription membership and it gives you access to everything. And believe me, especially now, when you're sitting home trying to figure out what to do, you're going to want to learn everything you possibly can. If we spend this time wisely, we're gonna come out of it with more skills that we can offer our clients and make more money. This is what you should be doing with your time. So head over to mz.com. Oh, and here's a cool thing. We usually have our sponsors try to give us some sort of an offer. You know what I mean? Something. Give us a promo code, give us a discount, whatever. What MZ is doing is they're going to donate 20% of all their sales to the Los Angeles Food Bank during this time. Okay, they're going to likely go all the way through April, which is amazing. It's amazing. So rather than giving all of us a 20% discount, which would certainly be great, it's so much more valuable to be giving it to the people at Los Angeles Food Bank. So become a member of MZ Pro or go there and buy some courses. And just by doing that, you yourself are donating to the Los Angeles Food Bank. And that can make you feel great. So you learn something, you do something good, all is good in the world. Check it out for yourself, mzmzed.com. And go learn something, right? Use this time wisely. MZ. Education for Creatives. So I've been thinking about best ways to use this time and what to kind of share with our audience. And there are a few things came to mind. Curious what you think. Um, it seems like now is the perfect time to learn a new skill, obviously. Like that, mm -hmm. this is the perfect time for that. Um, and I also, I think cinematographers that don't really know how to edit or aren't comfortable with it, learn to edit. I think that's going to make your work a lot better. It's going to probably change your uh, ideas on coverage and all sorts of stuff. I think it's going to inform a lot if cinematographers are, you know, using this time to hone their editing skills. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I think, I think any, any extra skills you have in the filmmaking world can only make you a better cinematographer, whether it's in um, editing you don't know, or any, any different avenue of it, the, of, um, of filmmaking, because the more you understand the entire scheme of things, the better, the better it'll inform your decisions on set every day. Absolutely. And one yeah. of the things I was thinking about too, is like, I'm thinking to myself, like, what are the things that are kind of annoying to do when I'm super busy and working on your website is the most annoying thing for me. I hate it. So <laughs> yeah. this is the time to make a demo reel for those. I mean, people like you don't necessarily need it because, you know, you already have a large resume of things that people can just watch. Um, it's different when you can say, yeah, go and watch, you know, Sabrina, go and watch um, uh, uh, Child's Play. Go and watch the major feature films and TV shows I've done. That's different. But when you're at my level <laughs> and, and people need to, um, you know, you need to sell yourself a little bit more, uh, I think I, I, this is a perfect time to make a little reel for yourself. Look, Absolutely. Look for your footage, look through your footage and do it. Now's the time. Um, yeah. and the other thing that I was thinking about, and it, it might prompt a larger conversation, but when I'm making director treatments, I'm always scouring everything I can to find some reference videos, uh, reference stills. Um, and it's kind of a pain in the ass to do because it takes a long time and it gets in the way of other projects when you're busy with certain things. I would love to get a sense from you. Like, do you think this is a good time to use to build up your library of reference stills? And if so, like, where do you go for those things? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I actually do that often anyways. Like I, I, I have on my computer, I have a folder that has, you know, 
a bunch of subfolders and subfolders within that. And they're all based on different references. And, you know, I'll break it down by location or lighting mood or genre or whatever it is. And I probably have thousands of images that I've saved in there. And yeah. it's, it's, that's what I do like throughout prep of any show or just sometimes if I'm sitting there at home and I find a, a nice image that I love from something, I'll just drop it in there. But I use, um, I use Shot Deck. Oh, is it that? Um, um, that's Lauren Schur's. It is, yeah. Oh, it's, yes. I actually did. I found found out about that not that long ago, like six months ago, or you know, within the last year for sure. And that website is fantastic. I yeah. mean, I, I love it. I, and is it public? I use yet? that. No, I think you have to. I believe you still have to kind of you have to register with them. Okay, but it's easy. I mean, if you're a filmmaker, you just. I think it was it was fairly easy. Um, All right, so let me just give it a proper plug since we're talking about it. Shotdeck.com, S-H-O-T-D-E-C-K.com. You can register for a beta account, and I suggest you guys do it. If you haven't heard the episode we did with Lauren Schur, the director of photography for Joker, it's kind of his thing. And um, I don't know if he started it alone or if he did it with a team or whatever, but I first heard about it from him, and I think he's deeply involved in it. And it is the perfect place to go for references. like. And it's grown so much, even since he came on, which was, when was that? I don't know, it was a while, it was back in October. So yeah, since he came on, it's grown a lot. But I'm so glad you brought that up because that's like exactly what I think people should be doing is yeah. putting together some, you know, putting together these little collections of visual examples so that the next time somebody comes to you, uh, you can have it handy. Yeah, absolutely. There's there are plenty of other, ref- like there's, um filmgrab.com i think i'm pretty sure it's filmgrab.com that it's yeah. the same idea maybe it's not as um thorough as, as shot deck now but I, I always bounce between those and just also google searching images like you know, just if i'm looking for an idea of something i'll kind of type in the idea in google images with with movies or cinema you know the word movie or cinema in there as well and see what pops up um, yeah i'm looking at that now film-grab.com we'll put this in the show notes yeah I think this is actually a really interesting area to explore when people have more free time. Um, mm-hmm. I, I haven't had too much luck with Google searching. Maybe I just stink at it. You know, I, I also use like um, Unsplash. I think they have some really nice photography on there. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's free. I don't know that one. It's basically free stock images. I use it for director's treatments all the time. Um, but there, there's no watermark. Everything is free. It's great. It's Unsplash. Dot com, I think. Maybe it's dot something else. Let me see. Unsplash. It's, yeah, unsplash.com. Um, you know, it's it's not stills from movies, but it's just kind of interesting, nice-looking photography. So that's a good reference as well. So yeah. these are great. Film grab. Do you use anything else? I think for references, it's, usually, it's pretty much between those. And the nice thing about uh, Shot Deck and, and Film Grab is that rather than like just Google is that um, the images are direct. They're like direct uh, screen grabs that haven't been altered. You know, like often enough I'll go onto Google and search something and it's been brightened or shifted in color. Yeah. So Film Grab and Shot Deck at least have like, you know, the true representation of the image, which is obviously that's a cinematographer's extremely important. So, um yeah, I, I Those love two that. are the best. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought that up. Okay, we're going to sort of conclude our discussion with a couple of audience questions um, that we can both kind of take a take a pass at. Um, okay. Uh, Francisco Barros is asking on a local level, how many jobs have you lost, and what's your future like? That uh, um, I don't know what he means by local. Maybe just smaller markets. Um, that could be the case. Uh, what do you think? Um, I mean, I know you kind of had this show going on that's on hold. Is there anything you've completely lost? I think it's too early to tell, yeah. you know, like, cause you know, I, I don't know what, what's gonna, if shows will, like if certain shows were in prep with her, I would imagine anything that was initially greenlit is still going to come back and go. Um, but it's, you know, we'll just have to wait and see what happens. And I can tell so you, for me, it was just this one that took the, took the hiatus, you know, there are the, you know, the time off until it's, it's back to normal. Yeah, yeah. But our intention with this is to keep going back and finishing. Um, that's good to hear. And Francisco, yeah. um, as far as I'm concerned, I, I haven't lost anything. I definitely have had clients that are nervous about 
like, can we actually get this done? Um, I've had to alter a couple of projects to change. You know, there were certain things that we were going to be shooting live action for that we're now trying to explore um, an animated option or, you know, some sort of a stock footage approach, anything we can do to keep a project alive. So as of this moment, I haven't lost anything, but that could change by next week. So <laughs> check back in with us then. <laughs> uh, Vinny Bach on Instagram. Um, do you guys think that once... Uh, the virus is gone, the market will catch up and will be really busy? Or do you think it will be a slow ramp up? What do you think? Again, hard to know. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't have the answer for that. I yeah. I want to say it's going to be amazing and we ha we're really super, super busy. But the work that I'm doing is so specific because it's like marketing and it's all based on sp specific timing, what's going on, different, different uh, seasons. I don't know. I mean, anything that's a spring or summer message may go. So I don't know, Vinny. I hope it's, I hope it's going to be really busy, but I don't know. Um, yeah. Uh, Renato Hoida, it may be normal for editors or producers to work rem remotely, but what about cinematographers? So, uh, well, we gave some advice on what cinematographers can do with their free time. As far as working goes, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> I think right now there's, uh, you know, there's, yeah, I don't think there's anything at the moment that we we can, that we can see or do in that sense. I think we, everything, whatever it is, it has to be a, like a rethink of it, you know, it has to be something new or something a little different, different avenue of some sorts. That's why photography, I think, is one of the greatest things for, for right now for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if, if a cinematographer that's listening out there, uh, or it could be you, Brendan, um, comes up with kind of a unique, innovative approach to something. And it's like this really interesting visual that no one has really seen before that you can do remotely. You don't need to include other people. You can maintain social distancing. You might be able to sell it to some to some brands to do something diff different. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. People need something new right now that doesn't require a group of people. So, you know, um, yeah. what's that saying? Necessity, uh, what is it? Necessity drives innovation or something like that. I'm I'm butchering it. But I think there is no, something. That's the where, idea. It, that's the idea. Like, there's a need now for content, and you can't really make any the traditional ways. So, you know, the first the first people to come up with new ways to do it are are going to win. Um, this is kind of an odd question. Uh, uh, Nat Nat Twenty Crafts on Instagram um, wants to know how do you film zombies in their best light, and what angles do you aim for when showcasing the undead? So, I, I don't. <laughs> Have you shot zombies before in any of your work? Uh, I have. A long time ago, I did a, a zombie, a film with zombies. You know, I think the best way to do it is to keep them somewhat darker and more contrasty. And, you know, don't try to overlight them and make sure that they still always have a mystery so that it's a little scarier to see. That would be my first, uh, I, I believe, you know, silhouettes or or edge light kind of thing works would work the best um but it all is case to case it's all dependent on on each scene and location and you know time of day and resources and everything um but i think as 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 a overall the more that you can keep them kind of darker and feeling a little more scary the better and um Nat 20 crafts on Instagram. I saw this question. I'm like, what the hell is this? <laughs> it's uh, I went to his page, D and D Dungeons and Dragons, miniatures, paintings, all sorts of different crafts. Like the artistry on this page is really, really cool. Clearly obsessed with the undead and all things ghoulish and weird. So <laughs> if you like that kind <laughs> of stuff, now I'm understanding where the question came from, but check out his Instagram page. Cause he has like really cool work on there. Nat nice. 20 crafts. Um, this fellow on Instagram, he wants to know, how has this affected your relationship with your rental houses? Ooh, um, I have something to say about that, but I'd like to start with you. I've had a really good relationship with Kezo Camera, who uh, was doing the last show. And I think it's, you know, it's been fine. I mean, I think they've, as far as our relationship's concerned, they've, like everyone else, you know, they had to they had to close their doors for the time being. And, and um, you know, we just, we just, we discussed how it was going to happen, how we were going to close it up for the for the moments, and and we moved through it. But it was it was a positive conversation with them, and they did everything they could to help us make it as smooth as possible. And we did the same thing to them. Um, 
And uh, on this show in particular, we were working with Kessel Camera through TCS in New York, and TCS was helping kind of facilitate and and kind of bridge the gap between uh, and between both companies. It was it was a really good positive experience, and they were you know they're they're pros that are here to help, and everyone's trying to figure it out. So so it was um, it was good. Yeah, you know, I, considering. I think the rental houses are going to be hit hard. I mean, here in Boston. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of our sponsors, Rule Boston Camera. Um, you can find them at rule.com. They are actually not going to be sponsoring the next uh, few months just because uh, what's going on now. You know, they had to make some layoffs. They had to pull some of their marketing budget, but we still love them, of course. Um, you know, keep your rental houses close. You know what I'm saying? Like they are, the the partnership between production and rental houses is so necessary and so strong. And it's like, you got to support those guys. I mean, obviously you can't yeah. go and rent stuff now if you're not shooting, obviously, but support them any way you can, because I'm sure they're going to want to support you as well. So just reach out to them, find out what's going on. Um, and I think just in general, this is a great time to meet new people. People are on Instagram and social media more now than they ever have been, you know, yep. that cinematographer you've always wanted to work with, that director you've always wanted to work with, producers, whoever, chances are they're just bouncing around at their house on Instagram, on LinkedIn, doing their thing. You might be able to get those meetings set up that you've always wanted to get set up. Um, take advantage of this time is, is kind of my, my, my big motivational statement for people. Don't let it get you down. Um, kind of on that, have you, have you found this opportunity as uh, a time that you can sort of reach out to people that you otherwise wouldn't be able to get in touch with? I think so. Yeah. I mean, I, I haven't, I haven't yet, but um, I have noticed what you're what you're saying. Like everyone's, you know, everyone's on social media right now. Everyone's talking. Everyone's doing live feeds, and and uh, and I think that's great. The writer, yeah, and I, I think now is the time to get in touch with them. <laughs> Absolutely, the the writer yeah. of uh, Billions. I think he's a showrunner too, Brian Koppelman, uh, the the uh, creator of Billions. Last week on Tuesday, he puts out on on uh, Twitter. Hey, I'm available from, you know, whatever, one to five to do podcasts. Who, who wants, who wants me on? Like that kind of stuff is happening. So, you know, stay online, stay active and, um, we'll get through this. So, so where can people find you online now? Now we're saying that you can reach out to people that you haven't wanted, uh, that you've wanted to, and haven't been able to before. So that might mean that your Instagram is open for conversation. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah, it so is for sure. If people want to reach out to you, talk more and just, you know, maybe you know, share some of their thoughts, where can they go? Uh, I'm on Instagram at, uh, at Brennan Ugama um, and Twitter, but Instagram is definitely the best. I yeah. put photos up there of different shows I've done all the time and open for discussions right now as well. And um, that would be the best place to for creative conversations and, and following work and that kind of thing. Perfect. Brendan Ugama, U-E-G-A-M-A. We'll put the link in the show notes as well. Um, Thank you so much for being on Go Creative Show. And um, I wish you the absolute best of luck when this thing simmers down. I hope you get that pilot back and uh, only, only the most success for you moving forward. Thank you very much. You as well. So I'm here with Matt Donnelly. He's a senior film writer for Variety and um, uh, so happy to have you on because there's so much to talk about in the film world right now. Uh, Matt, thank you so much for being on Go Creative Show. My pleasure. Thank you. I hope everyone is staying sane and well. I Honestly, staying sane is probably going to be the hardest <laughs> part because, yeah. you know, we're, you know, production is a, a pretty active you know, thing. You're you're on set. You're communicating with people. There's a lot of um, going from set to set, and the days are kind of packed with activity. And uh, you know, when that goes away, you sort of have this feeling of like, Jesus, what the hell am I going to do next? <laughs> it's it's yeah. a it's a horrifying, scary feeling. And um, you know, maybe you can soothe some of those horrors, or maybe you can inflame them. We'll find out. But, <laughs> but <laughs> my thing is, first of all, I, I'd like to just kind of start with a general introduction, so people are familiar with you know who you are, what you do, and um, and we'll start there. So, sure. yeah, I, I mean, I, my, I, I'm a senior film writer at Variety. I cover sort of the core um, 
you know, business of Hollywood, um, and then so much more. You know, we we look at the major studios, all the content production makers, and sort of the overall exciting and 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 incredibly uh, fluid <laughs> yeah. content pipeline for for the global audience. And then you know, beyond that, we cover sort of the culture of Hollywood. Um, you know, from boardrooms and agencies, and uh, also the award circuit is a big part of our coverage. Um, so yeah, we're sort of we're right in the middle of a lot of conversations about uh, you know content. So what have you seen at, is the most common response from production uh, to COVID nineteen? What what is happening for the most part? For the most part, people, I, I think, you know, and this is um, not to be political, but I think a criticism of our country overall is that we were a bit slow to respond to this because, you, you know, the guidance that we got from the CDC was, and still sort of is, that that this disease is a low risk uh, to the general public. Obviously, in the past few days, it's been elevated to a national emergency and everyone is self-quarantining or self-isolating. Um, but, you know, I think that with, again, with all this on the line, I think a lot of productions were just proceeding with caution, but then effectively did shut down. Everyone is basically shut down. I, I'm aware this week, especially that a lot of people, um, in post-production are finally being set up to work from home. So there is some work being done. Mm. Um, but basically it's been a full stop. Uh, it's only been the only, it's, it's about two weeks. That's, that's what people are. That's like the guideline. Uh, shutdowns are effective through the end of March, and then uh, everyone will individually revisit their production at the top of April and see if it's safe to come back. And I don't believe that it will be. That opinion that it it won't be, do you feel that that is shared among the community? I think that right now there's a, there's an overwhelming sentiment in, in the majority of the American public that we should all be staying at home and avoiding contact to sort of flatten the curve. You might have heard that that expression, um, that, that is w- what people are sort of taking on to themselves as a responsibility. Now, there are many filmmakers that, that would probably love to get back to set because, you know, it's, it's not, in, you know, in Hollywood, we have this unique sort of intersection of identity because number one, it's everyone's livelihoods, but everyone comes here to fulfill their dreams, right? Even if you look at someone like Paul Schrader, did you see his, uh, <laughs> his comments about his film shutdown this week? No, no. What did he say? Yeah, Paul Schrader has a film in production with uh, uh, Willem Dafoe and Oscar Isaac. And um, he, I, I won't repeat the word, but he called the studio cowards, basically. That's mm. that's a lot kinder than what he said for shutting down because he wants to proceed. Um, and I think a lot of people, uh, Rob McElhaney from um, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. I know I probably didn't pronounce his last name right. Yeah, yeah. Um, he he wants to reopen his room and his, his writer's room and his, and his set in two weeks and do wellness checks and take everyone's temperature because he wants his career to be paid. Uh, so I think a lot of people are anxious to get back to work. But the the pervasive sentiment is that we should all sort of stay home and do our part. But that's a dire economic consequences. Exactly. And it's also constantly changing. Like we're, we're talking to you. I don't know when you guys are listening, but we're talking to you. What's today? The, the 19th of March. So we're yes. in, in the, the changes to at least here in Boston, just a few days ago, it was it was Monday night, I think, or Sunday night that they said restaurants closed, you know, where we aren't self quarantining yet. I mean, well, self, well, we're self quarantining, but we don't have like, um, it's not like a mandate, but there, the restrictions are the amount of people you can have in one space is 25. Although now the recommendation is 10, but I, I think the, the law is still 25, um, here in Massachusetts. Right. So right now in kind of mid March, it's March 19th right now, we're seeing basically all production has shut down. But I'd love to just get a little bit of a timeline of kind of how the dominoes fell uh, from, you know, from Hollywood standpoint and production standpoint where where you are. Um, wh- I guess what was the first sign and what was the first major change to production that kind of began this slide to where we are now? It's a great question. You know, I think a lot of this has been a game of chicken between the content companies and 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 you know distributors and and sort of seeing testing the waters of what the American public was willing to withstand in terms of um, you know how they would engage with with stuff and as a global audience, I think that easily the first domino to fall was MGM and Universal pushing the release date of the new Bond film, uh, No Time to Die. Yep. Um, that was the first real. I think indication to the business and to Wall Street and to audiences that they were not confident that, that movie could perform on a global scale because of the effects of the virus. Um, and it was, I think, it was a real 
um, game changer. Because if you look what followed suit, everyone else has subsequently moved huge premium movies off the calendar. Um, from I feel like Mulan was the, the one I heard about right after Bond. And I'm sure there were others, but that was another one that really stuck in my head. Absolutely. And Milan specifically was a massive cooperative effort with China. Um, and if you look at the history of that film, the, the original animated project was not well received in the country and was sort of seen as like almost, uh, you know, objectifying or denigrating that culture. So this was a huge co-production between the two countries. And, and they were considering release in the middle of the China's worst period, suffering in, in, in new cases of, of COVID-19. So that couldn't really happen. And then look at everything that came afterwards. Universal moved Fast 9. And you know, the Fast and Furious franchise is a movie that, number one, has to do well for the very health and stability of Universal Pictures and, and NBC Universal at large. And also Fast and Furious is a truly global franchise. I believe 75% of box office in the past three movies are all from China, which is a staggering number. Um, so, you, you know, th these are obviously sound financial decisions, but it, it raises off the alarms. And then obviously a lot of people followed suit. Um, Disney's pulled Black Widow. Um, they've also pulled other Fox titles that they inherited this year in, 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 in acquiring Fox, 20th Century Fox, like The Woman in the Window. Um, you know, there's just any number of, of calendar changes and everyone's sort of betting on the back half of the year to come back. But that was really the first moment. Bond really set off a lot of alarms. And that was films that are done that are holding off on distribution. But what about productions? Like, do you, can you point to one of the early productions that completely shut down that kind of started this? I think television uh, was sort of like the first, you know, any set is obviously a hotbed of human interaction, of course, right? Yeah. It's not just your actors, it's, it's everyone, it's multiple departments. And then, um, you know, I think Olivia Wilde always says, and I'm sure your listeners know this, but for anyone who doesn't, you know, film sets are like construction sites. Yeah. It's not this like, it's not this like quiet, reverent experience where everyone's watching art come alive. It's a mini city of activity that has yeah. to continually go. Um, so I think television really took the lead and and, and they started falling like dominoes. Um, and not just in their physical production, but even the writers' rooms. Those are communal places too. So, and I think that you saw that happen a lot across um, places like Warner Brothers Television Production, Universal Content Production, because those companies become liable, right? Um, if you're encouraging people to come to work and they contract the disease, that could be considered negligence by some lawyers. So it's not just yes, it's first and foremost a priority for the loss of human life, but. These companies then could become liable. So I, I think television really stepped up and started discouraging uh, sort of these this, these communal gatherings, and then movies followed suit. Mm. Yeah, and it does make sense. I mean, if we are going to be social distancing, if we are going to be paying more attention to that, film sets are just—it's mm -hmm. so hard to do it. It's just—I don't know how—I don't know how you can do it without having. You, you really can't. You really can't. It's basically what it is. You really can't. So shutting down makes the most sense under the new guidelines. Yeah. But I've got a couple of questions. Um, sure. These films that are not being released, uh, I can only assume that, you know, as you hold back on releases, you're going to start stockpiling what needs to come out. You're going to start messing up with your uh, distribution schedule. Yeah. Are you hearing anybody say that they're going to instead release on Netflix or release on Disney Plus or Hulu? in lieu of a theatrical release, because there's so many people, you know, at home able right. to watch these things. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, you bring up a sort of, uh, you know, long gestating, very contentious conversation about what we at Variety and in the business would call the theatrical window. So normally, movie theater owners uh, across the world um, demand 90 days of exclusivity with any new movie that's coming out. Um, so after that period of 90 days, the studios and, and the content makers are free to take that to the next place, the next release window, which would be, um, you know, the iTunes store, uh, DVD release, and then finally to streaming video on demand in places like Netflix and Hulu. Um, you know, with the country on lockdown, obviously, you've seen a lot of moves in the past few days um, of studios taking their, their already released films, but very recently released films like The Invisible Man. Um, uh, you know, Trolls World Tour, which actually has yet to come out, 
um, and rushing them to, to VOD because people are stuck at home, which is, a, I think, a really good courtesy to an anxious country. Yeah. Um, but but this is obviously a, a huge point of contention for the movie theater owners because that's the core of their business. Um, they can't really compete with people who need to stay at home, <laughs> and it's, well, especially their clothes. But even in a traditional non-coronavirus setting, um, you know, uh, streaming is a huge existential threat to the American movie theater. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't anticipate any studio would be so bold as to directly go um, right to streaming video on demand uh, because you know we're operating under the assumption that eventually this is going to be over yep. and we're going to have to come back to the movies and you're going to deal with you know a, a country full of irate movie theater owners. Um, that's not to say though. A lot of films that have been pushed, you know, I can't name names, but we're, we're trying to break a few of them. A lot of the films that have been pushed that are studio titles that aren't massive tent poles, you know, I think like um, think mid-budget comedies, um, rom-coms, I think that, that they are very likely um, to go to places like Netflix or to Amazon Prime because the studios have already spent the marketing money. If you look at, I mean, if you want to do a little slew thing, if you look at movies that had full marketing campaigns and bus side ads and trailers and commercials that now aren't coming out, yeah. it's very unlikely that the studio is going to spend that money again in six months to try to get you to the theater for diminished returns. That's a good point. So I think yeah. you can expect, yeah, I think you can expect some to go, but certainly not not the not the franchises and the sequels and, and the big money makers. Yeah, that the you know you certainly know more about it than I do, and I'd like to get a, just a touch more into this. Um, sure. This. I, I don't want to say battle, but this, you know, conflict, I guess, between yeah. movie theaters and streaming, because, you know, you have to have a theatrical release in order to be eligible for Academy Awards. So the, you have to yes. have it. But yes. I know there was a lot of uh, a lot of rumors swir swirling around that there was quite a lot of friction with the um, filmmakers for. Um, oh my God, the mob movie that's like five hours long. I can't. The Irishman. The Irishman. <laughs> yes, the Irishman because they were exclusively for Netflix, but then also did a theatrical release in order to get the Academy Award uh, qualification. So, mm -hmm. uh, w what are you seeing as the trend and the balance, I guess, between theaters and the and um, uh, VOD releases moving forward? Yeah, it, it's. I mean, it's it's a very. Um, juicy and, and 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 often heated question but i think that there's a i think the movie theater owners have to sort of come to a realization uh that that the future is coming and they need to sort of be on board w with how you know these release patterns will work another point that often gets left out is the theater owners demand three months of exclusivity with Windows, but oftentimes do not play those movies for that amount of time. Like Avengers yeah. Endgame will play for six months, but you know even The Invisible Man, which is which had a fantastic performance, was going into its fourth week. It's it, you know the, the percentage drops of weekend to weekend of people going to the movie are staggering. It's yeah. already you know you're you're making your money in opening weekend, and then if you have a healthy run, God bless you. But if not, most most movies do not need ninety days to realize their full box office potential. Um, and the studios have long been resentful that they can't go to the next window to, um, you know, to, to sale, which we call electronic sell through, which would go to like your Amazon storefront, the iTunes store, you know, buy your ultra 4k HD version of an end game, um, you know, 30 days after it was in theaters, because there's more incentive for the customer to want to see that if you couldn't make it to the theater. So this is like a, a very, sorry if that's too in the weeds, but that's like at the heart of the conversation. Oh, it's helpful. Um, Absolutely. Good. Um, that's sort of the crux of the conversation. So the theaters don't really need that much time. I think it's more knowing that they have a chokehold um, on on how and when the content moves to the next place. Because obviously, and the other thing too, the, the other dirty secret of the American movie theater, um, which is actually... I think quite obvious is that they really don't make money on tickets. It's concessions. Yeah. That is the, that is the profit margin for theaters. So they, they, you know, they, they rely on the idea of movie going as a habitual American pastime, which it increasingly is not. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, in terms of the awards rates, yeah, I mean, Netflix um, spent uh, hundreds of millions of dollars on the Irishman, not just for production and for its awards campaign, but it also gave it its most, its most healthy, you know, The Irishman has become sort of the most significant um, theatrical release for Netflix. They put it in theaters for a month before it hit Netflix, which yeah. is something that they have absolutely no incentive to do. Um, you know, Netflix goal, Netflix's goal is to is to gain subscribers, not to make money at the box office. Yeah. Um, which I thought was a gesture, but I think roundly, 
um, you know, awards voters and, and, and that traditional Hollywood community see Netflix still as a bit of an existential threat, even though Netflix is funding incredible artistic work like, you know, Marriage Story from Noah Baumbach. Other on any other season would have been like a Sony Pictures Classics release. Yeah. It would have had it would have had minimal or not minimal, but it wouldn't have had a, you know, a multi-million dollar awards chest or war chest for awards campaigning. Um, you know, I think that elevated that movie to incredible places. And even something like The Two Popes, you know, they, they have a robust program of films, um, but I think that they're still sort of iterating how that can work where it doesn't threaten, uh, you know, the traditional players. So it, it's, I, I'm so sorry this is so nerdy, but it's such a great and like a very complicated conversation to have. I love it. I think this is yeah. exactly what our listeners want to hear. It's what I want to hear for sure. And I actually want to just get a little bit more insight into the award sure. campaigning that people go through. Yeah. I, I think a lot of people don't really understand how difficult and how challenging it is to actually have your film being campaigned for. What is it like? Yes. Um, I, I, well, first of all, you've got, uh, you know, the award season is not just the Oscars. You know, the, the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences has about 7,000, 8,000 members um, and each individual branch which is like actors, directors, cinematographers, et cetera, um, vote on their own nominees and 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 categories. Um, but, you know, there's any a number of other shows. There's the Golden Globes or the Guild Awards. So you're looking at the Producers Guild, the Writers Guild, the Screen Actors Guild. So it's this entire machine full of craftspeople and, and creatives that you need to get your film in front of. So, you know, a big part of that expense is screeners physically printing DVDs to mail out to people so they make you make sure they see your movie to vote for it. That costs, I, I mean, I, I'm not getting you anywhere from 800000 to a million dollars for printing. Wow. Just to get it out in the mail. Um, and then oftentimes if you're campaigning, you've got your talent. So if you have a movie like Bombshell, right? Yeah. You've got three A-list actresses who have wardrobe stylists, um, impossible schedules, need to fly private all over the, you know, all over the country back and forth to sit for Q and A's with guild members. Um, that certainly adds up. Um, and by the way, they're worth it. I'm not saying they're not worth it. Yeah, of course. Of course. I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, so that's the expense. And then also a lot of uh, awards campaigning is regular campaigning. You need a big marketing budget. Um, you know, Netflix, one of their um, genius moves uh, for Roma, which is two years ago, which is another yeah. big hopeful for them. Um, they bought every, uh, almost every piece of standalone advertising space. That means like, you know, poster boards and even like wraparounds um, in airport terminals where they knew uh, members would be flying in and out from Los Angeles. Wow. So they're like basically wallpapering LAX and ads for Romas, knowing that all the Hollywood people would be coming to the terminals. Um, so, so that's where the money really comes from. And, and obviously the more you spend, the more traction you get. Now, when you see a film like Roma um, that could not have made a ton of money, but is being yeah. pushed really heavily for a campaign. Uh, where does that money come from? Like if they're not, if it's not making a ton, is it just rolled mm -hmm. into an overall production budget or where, do, where, do, how do people allocate this? <laughs> the studios are cutting the checks. Yes. And that's, and that's sort of allocated in a marketing or a specialty budget. A lot of companies that like, you know, for instance, Universal um, is the uh, Universal Pictures owns Focus Features. That's their awards arm. So their marketing budgets and their sort of awards campaign budgets comes from a larger purse that's separate from production budget. God, if we if Hollywood rolled in marketing costs and awards budgets into production budgets, you, you would cry over how expensive movies would become. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I wouldn't. I I. I I think I phrased that wrong saying production budget. I'm thinking more in terms of, is it part of like, is the decision to allocate funds for award campaigning part of the, the budgeting at the beginning of a film? Or is it something that they wait to find out, A, if the film's going to be good, or B, if it's well-received by its first audience? Yeah. I think I think it depends on the project. I think that if your focus features and you know you have the new Paul Thomas Anderson movie, you better allocate ten to fifteen million dollars to campaign for awards for it, wow. because everything he does, everything he does, will be in consideration. Now it, it can vary though, and and also like look at even the festival market. If you're a twenty four and you go to Sundance and you have to have Hereditary, yeah, right, and Hereditary is amazing and it plays well. And then when you open it and you see the response to it, Hereditary, by the way, I believe is still the highest grossing theatrical A24 movie ever. Wow. Over $40 million at the box office. And it's a genre title, but it's amazing. So once it you see really that response- It really is. We had the director yeah. of photography from it on. I'm, I'm a huge A24 oh, fan. Sounds like you are too. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, but when you realize that, you say to yourself, oh my God, 
like, holy shit, this is going to be an awards player. Now we have to throw money behind Tony Collette. So then you have to probably go out and either raise some cash. A lot of companies, a lot of indie players take loans um, and, and consider that additional marketing expenses. Um, so it really does vary. But if you're, if you're a big studio, you can probably identify what's going to need money and allocate it as such. Let's take a quick break and talk about Post Lab. Now, Post Lab is a collaboration tool for Final Cut Pro 10 that allows you to share libraries, track and save changes, and make sure that no more than one person is working on the same library simultaneously. Now, let's face it, we are all home much more than we ever thought we would be. And uh, I know many of you are spending this time to edit some projects, right? Maybe you're making a new, I don't know, a demo reel for yourself, or you're working on some client work. There's always some editing to do. And if you're using Final Cut Pro, uh, you're going to love the ability to collaborate seamlessly with other editors. That's what PostLab lets you do. And they're always updating the app. In fact, in fact, the most recent update eliminated the need for relinking. Yes, no more relinking, right? So if nothing else, you have to check out gocreativeshow.com forward slash postlab just to learn about that. Now, Postlab is a cloud service and a desktop app. It's the best of both worlds. And it's because Postlab allows you to work off a local copy of your project. So you don't have to worry about internet speeds or anything like that. no you are using a local copy of your production. In fact, it kind of just feels like you're working on Final Cut the way you always would. And then when you need that collaboration, you have it because the, the cloud that PostLab uses is custom built for libraries. And if you guys have ever tried to share Final Cut libraries on other cloud services, right? It's not so good. That problem is resolved with PostLab. In fact, many problems are resolved with PostLab. It's a stress-free collaboration in Final Cut Pro 10. And isn't that all what we want, right? You can get three months free at gocreativeshow.com forward slash postlab. Three months free, gocreativeshow.com forward slash postlab. And I cannot stress this enough. Now is the time, like I've been saying, learn a new skill. Maybe Final Cut Pro is your new skill, right? If you're going to use Final Cut, you should also be using Postlab. It's that plain and simple. And you can trust me because I've been using Final Cut from day one, people. Day one. GoCreativeShow.com forward slash PostLab for your three free months. <laughs> Obviously, this, you know, COVID-19 is not going to completely destroy the Hollywood industry. It's going mm -hmm. to start up again at some point. Are you hearing any timelines from anybody? Are people starting to pinpoint months where production may begin again or yeah. projects that they may start with or anything that is sort of positive forward thinking in the Hollywood industry right now? Right. What I can tell you is that from, from, our, from, from multiple sources that we talk to routinely, um, the studios are telling places like the agencies and, and talent that they anticipate eight weeks to start again. Okay. Um, which I, I don't know if that's an optimistic number. I don't know if that's a that's a precise number. Um, I, 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 we'll have to see. But that they're telling, they're saying two months. That means productions will have to go at the top of June. Um, I, the one that we're sort of looking at now is Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. Mm. That should be on track to start on time um, if everything is uh, okay. And then the other another fascinating part of this too is that when you've got top movie stars you get yourself into a bit of a scheduling nightmare. So yeah. take, for instance, the movie Red Notice. That's a Netflix original that's uh, that's well over, I think the package is well over $120 million um, to shoot. That's Dwayne Johnson, Ryan Reynolds, and Gal Gadot. That was in the middle of production and shut down, and they need to come back on that. Now, both Dwayne and Ryan Reynolds have projects they need to do by September. Um, I believe Dwayne has to start on Black Adam, which is his... Uh, Marvel, or is that is that a Marvel property? It's a superhero property at New Line. Um, but he has commitments. He's in the middle of the shoot for Red Notice. So if they can't go back for two months, then I imagine that would mean Black Adam has to push its start date. So you're looking at, again, another set of domino effect uh, with future productions. But I think <laughs> I think that would be a happy problem to have at this point. Um, let's just let's get people out of the house and back to work. Exactly. Are you seeing any areas where people are working? Earlier in the show, you said editing is kind of getting up and running. Are we seeing visual mm -hmm. effects teams getting getting put on jobs or 
wh- where are you seeing it? Yes, actually, it's, it's a lot of it's in post. Um, voice, I, I know a few voice actors personally who have been set up at home, which is encouraging. Um, a lot of anim- animation people have have started to figure out how to get this done. Um, which, by the way, isn't cheap. Um, you know, I know I know one person who had a sixty thousand dollar bay installed in their basement, and they're terrified to have it in the house. Wow! <laughs> um, so that's 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 getting done. Um, and then, yes, the effects houses are figuring out a workflow where people can work from home, so that finished films can can maybe get polished and released. You know, at, released at some point, um, and hopefully by the end of twenty twenty. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's mostly post. I mean, everybody else. I, the other thing, the other place where I think work is being done is in development. So you've got people who are, you know, executives, development executives, uh, creative showrunners sitting at home, probably working on their next project or identifying what they want to do the second that we get, you know, the green light to come back to society. <laughs> yeah. So I think that when we come back, you'll see a flurry of announcements about people that want to start and then maybe how that could possibly happen. Um, but we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. Do you think any, do you think that there's going to be any lasting effects of what happened here with coronavirus? Do you think Hollywood production is going to change in some way to almost be more prepared for something in the future? Mm. I mean, I, I hope preparedness will be, uh, uh, yes, will be, will be one of the side effects of, of this pandemic. Um, but I, I think in terms of practicality, um, one thing I've been, I've been hearing a lot of this week is that um, a lot of the casting people um, have been sort of assist, insisting on and relying on self-tape from actors where you basically just film your audition and submit it as opposed to coming in person. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the casting people I've spoken to uh, fear, some fear and some sort of uh, uh, celebrate that this is going to become the norm, that in-person auditions will basically cease. Mm. And perhaps the same for table reads. I don't know that you can prepare for something like this. Uh, or maybe just perhaps maybe tighter schedules, um, which isn't good for anybody. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But I mean, yeah, you certainly can't, pre- you, I guess you can't fully prepare for something that's completely unprecedented, but I'm wondering if there are things in the workflow in, you know, like you said, maybe shorter schedules or mm-hmm. uh, an emphasis on, you know, voice actors and post-production houses being able to work more remotely. Like those things, it could be one of those things where some of these changes are implemented during COVID-19 and then people say, you know what, I kind of like this workflow. I kind of yeah. think this can work. Like. I'm curious to see how the dust settles. Right. And actually, to to that point, I think one thing that everyone's realizing is, um, and, you know, a a smaller part of the story that's not as relevant right now is that piracy is a huge deal, right? Yeah. So one of the other reasons that um, the studios would consider maybe putting movies abroad, like Fast 9, one of the reasons that maybe Universal would consider putting that online for a $30 price point is because if people want the movie, they're going to find a way to pirate it, right? Yeah. Uh, if it's out in some territories and not in others, so that becomes a concern. In terms of production workflow, um, you know, when you've got people who are handling, you know, incredibly sensitive assets, you know, really, really in-demand movies, uh, they all, all that footage lives in the studio, right? Wow. All that workflow lives inside the vaults of the studio. If they have, to, I think what people are learning to do is, uh, refine and and sort of deploy advanced security systems so people can download these sort of precious <laughs> these precious production assets and work on them from home. So I think that that's a sort of wake up call that Hollywood needs to find a better digital way to produce. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point and something that for sure is going to happen. It's like all these things you're bringing up all these things that I didn't even think about just privacy and the piracy. It just the, the movie theater effects. Like there's so. This yeah. touches so many people, so many industries. It's it's incredible. It's absolutely yeah. incredible. It's, uh, yeah, it can, it, can, it's, it can make you dizzy if you think about how many tentacles uh, this has. But, um, you know, I, I, the one thing I will say, though, <clears throat> specifically about theaters, is that uh, at some point, you know, the, the box office may be down, but it's still... It's still billions in revenue, right? Yeah. Um, at some point, when it is safe to return, I'm sure... You know, you know, a lot of filmmakers w- would tell you that the idea behind what they do, and a lot of a lot of artisans and craft people and crew members, the reason they do what they do is because they want it to be seen by a shared audience. Yep. So I'm sure that you're going to see a massive campaign full of A-list filmmakers and movie stars encouraging people to come back to the movies. You know, even in China right now, if you can believe it, they're reopening some of the cinemas, 
And they're planning on opening more across the country because they did a phenomenal job at controlling the disease. Um, they're lining up this bench of incredible movies, not just Chinese language, but English language, beloved hits of, of, of cinema treasures to sort of celebrate the idea of going to the movies. And I think you can absolutely see that being replicated here. Um, so there, there will be, the medium has its protectors, you know what I mean? So it's not all a streaming game, but I think everyone definitely has to work smarter. Can you talk to me a little bit about how how um, film festivals are dealing with coronavirus? And I mean, are some getting canceled or things getting postponed? What are you seeing out there? Yeah, this has been a sort of devastating blow to the festival circuit because you have to realize that, you know, festivals, number one, are obviously massive gatherings of people in small theaters <laughs> watching movies. Um, and then there's also a sort of a micro economy around that of, you know, a sales market for indie films. There's a ton of parties and brand activations. You know, we at Variety do talent portrait and interview studios at most of these things. It's a very highly tactile sort of event. Um, but also festivals have their place in the awards ecosystem, right? So movies like Parasite, that opened in Cannes last year in May, won the Palme d'Or, and then got a head start running off to Best Picture. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're very fragile things. But yes, Cannes has yet to cancel. Um, and we believe it's because something in their insurance policy, the government would have to mandate a shutdown of the festival in order for the entire operation not to go belly up. Okay. So that's, that's in some version of that. So that's why they've yet to cancel. But yeah, that's been moved. South by Southwest um, has, has increasingly built a really exciting program of films. Um, and they had to cancel in the 11th hour. Yeah. Uh, they canceled five days before people... We're meant to premiere there, which is another, you know, and also South by Southwest does a lot of really experimental and up and coming programming. So you're looking at directors who need critical and audience reception to launch their films, to get them sold and to build their own careers. So yeah, it's, it's been kind of a bummer. But the good news is uh, if we can get past this, um, Toronto is coming up in September, as is the Telluride Film Festival in Colorado. And I think that those two things could be really big bright spots, right? Where people are coming together to celebrate. And a lot of the movies that were meant to play and these canceled festivals will get their chance. Um, and among those movies are uh, the new Wes Anderson, The French Dispatch, with uh, Tilda Swinton and Timothy Chalamet. Yeah. And there's a new Sofia Coppola that many people are excited about called On the Rocks. It's another Bill Murray movie that uh, also has Rashida Jones, and that's an Apple TV Plus release. Um, so I think that we'll, you know, if we can get to September <laughs> and we're allowed to congregate, that'll be a great moment. Well, there's so much going on right now in Hollywood. It's a constantly ever-changing thing. And I think uh, it's good to hear from you that people have, although production has stopped, creativity hasn't. People are still yes. active. People are still figuring out what to do next. There's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, discussions going on about what the next step is. And uh, I love hearing that. That's encouraging to me. Um, do you have any advice for maybe new budding filmmakers that... Uh, are trying to, you know, get production going, trying to release their film now in this crazy time period. Like, do you have any advice for them on best practices to, you know, start maybe building a name for themselves? Absolutely. I think that, you know, I would, number one, seize on what's right in front of you, which is the fact that everyone is at home. <laughs> so if you have proof of concept, if you have storyboards, if you have script pages, if you have anything, a lot of people are sitting around looking at social media. A lot of people are looking for things to read and watch. Um, so I would say kind of, you know, utilize a captive audience while you have it. But if not, use this time to really just dig in on your work. I know that if you're a director, you probably can't go outside and shoot. Um, but I don't know, force your kids and your cat to to <laughs> make a production in your living room. Um, no, I, I just would use the time to really sort of just sink in and 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 work on your craft and 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 read as much as you can, write as much as you can, um, and take the time. It's sort of a forced hiatus for all of us. And then also reach out. I, you know, a lot of that's people what are I was just going to say. This that's what I was just going to say. Like this, this is a perfect time to try to contact the people that you otherwise would never be able to reach because they right. may be at home just just happening to be looking at their emails at the right time. Exactly. And I know that there is community out there for everybody. So if you're, you know, uh, an IATSE member, if you're, I'm sorry, if you're a crew member, um, you know, if you're a caterer, <laughs> yeah. if you're anyone who's affected by production, I know you're, I know you're certainly not alone. Um, and also read variety. <laughs> exactly. And do you know, do you know of any like organizations in place or any resources that people can turn to when they're kind of not working right now in the, in the production industry? Well, actually, I know that there's a there's a petition that has over, I think at this point, 65 or 70,000 letters sent to Congress that is urging 
um, urging Congress to include displaced entertainment workers in the relief package that is coming. Mm. You know, this trillion, this trillion dollar stimulus and relief package called Families First. So um, that is led by a labor union called IATSE. IATSE, I can probably spell it out for you, but you can link it to somewhere. I-A-T-S-E? Um, so, yeah, yes, exactly. Okay. Um, and then... Uh, yeah, I mean, there, there are individual, um, there are individual guild and, and, and sort of union places like uh, the SAG After Foundation. If you know, if you're a union actor who's fallen on hard times, look them up. Um, you know, uh, the music industry has an amazing um, group called Music Cares. If you're a composer, um, yeah, so they're out there. But also, just I, I would highly encourage you to be talking to everybody. Um, Self isolation does not mean that you have to sit solitary in silence. I love that. Great note to end on, uh, Matt Donnelly senior film writer for Variety. Uh, where can people find out more about you and read your stuff? Thank you so much. We're at Variety.com and I am on Twitter at Matt Donnelly. It's uh, M-A-T-T-D-O-N-N-E-L-L-Y. There it is. And I'll put all of Matt's links in the show notes as well. But thank you so much for coming on. And I kind of feel like this needs to be a more consistent segment. If you, uh, I-, I think that would be a lot of fun to have you on um, maybe a couple times a year just to talk about the film industry, where we're going, and and chit-chat about exciting new films coming up. Absolutely, anytime, and, and especially in the next two weeks. I'll just be here cleaning my apartment. <laughs> <laughs> so Matt Donnelly's our guest for the next three episodes, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Matt. Um, I really appreciate it, and um, looking forward to speaking with you next time. Thank you so much. Everybody stay uh, sane and healthy. All right, I want to thank our guests today, Brendan Ugama and Matt Donnelly. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Now, remember, guys, this is part one of a two-part series um, all about coronavirus and COVID-19's impact on production. This was our kind of Hollywood high-level episode, but the next one's going to be the local level. How are, uh, you know, smaller production companies, freelancers, how are we dealing with this um, pandemic? We certainly would welcome your questions. So please send them to us on our social media, uh, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, at Go Creative Show. I want to thank our producer, Connor Crosby, for putting it all together behind the scenes. You can find him at ignitionvisuals.com. And of course, Matt Russell for mixing and mastering and making the show sound so good. You can find him at gamestructure.com and on Twitter at gamestructure. And while you're on Twitter, tweet me, say hi. In fact, you know what? Go to my Instagram. Don't even worry about Twitter for me. Go to my Instagram. Because I've been posting a lot on there. A lot of behind the scenes. Uh, We've been putting together these little videos of how we make our commercials. Um, A ton of like reposts from really cool visual effects things that I love. I am having a blast on Instagram lately. And um, it's also been fun talking to you guys there too. So yeah, follow me there. Forget about Twitter. I'm more active on Instagram, right? Ben Consoli at Ben Consoli on Instagram. And of course, all things Go Creative Show are at gocreativeshow.com. You can subscribe to our podcast there. You can sign up and um, uh, to our mailing list and um, certainly follow us on social media, all from gocreativeshow.com. And don't forget our sponsors, MZ Education for Creatives and Post Lab Stress-Free Collaboration for Final Cut Pro 10. Without these people, the show wouldn't exist, so please support those that support us, and we'll be back here next week for another episode of Go Creative Show. <laughs>